This is a class talk, so I would like to bore the guests, including the president of AUC, by some basics about our class. I plan, even though we have distinguished experts, I planned it to fit into our class. This is the primary objective of today's talk. On Sunday, we have been discussing theories of international relations. And we talked about two classical schools, realism or power school and interdependence or liberal school. Do you remember we said, yes, there is international anarchy, there is interdependence, but one component is missing. Do you remember the component we emphasized? You remember? Somebody? We talked about international anarchy, and we said something is missing. We talked about international hierarchy. International hierarchy. It's not only interdependence. It is not only international anarchy. It is international hierarchy, power grading. And this brings me in to the talk about the US. Can, can you please shut the door? And the idea that the global system is characterized by unevenness. Power differences. You see it in the Security Council with the veto. But especially for the US, if you look at the defense budget of the US, it is much more than the nine countries that follow the US combined. Something related to Egypt, the US in the IMF has 22% of the vote. If Egypt wanted to have the loan, the U.S. has to agree. With the end of the Cold War, we had two theories that emphasized the primacy of the U.S. End of history, everything has been decided in favor of liberal international order. And number two, Discussion, you probably saw that in the literature, the so-called unipolar moment. What my colleagues are going to talk about is crucial, not only to the Middle East, but to the global system. This country that dominates so much, where does it fit? And with what some people call political madness in Washington, where are we going? not only about the Middle East, but about the global world. I'll ask, we are, we are lucky to have these two experts today. They were yesterday in a conference about Camp David, which apparently is, is fully covered in Al Ahram this morning. And graciously, they offered to come and talk to students. And I jumped on the occasion, and we have this joint enterprise with the Department of Political Science. So I'll give the floor to AUC president, who has also found the time to come and introduce these two colleagues, and then we will have the talk right after. Thank you, Dr. Bakat. Thanks to all of you. Um, for some, I guess it's a class time. You, you, are, you have to be here, but I see many uh, colleagues as well as uh, other students and uh, our presidential interns who don't have to be here except because of your passion for learning and knowledge and, uh, and public policy in this case. I, I always say how happy I am to be at this very special university in a special country at a really important time. I think it, for me, one of uh, some years of experience dealing with Egypt, this could be an inflection point and I hope uh, that there's at least a possibility uh, 
that it can be a, a kind of renaissance for Egypt. It can be, but it will depend actually on what the people in this room go out and do with your educations when you go on from here. In a way, uh, what we're doing is kind of not special but typical, and it's the, the typicalness of having practitioners come and be part of our education that makes us special. So it's both typical and special. This is, we have guests today who are of unusual prominence, and that does make it special. Um, for those who are political science majors, you probably had to argue with your parents about being permitted to be political science majors. How are you going to get a job? What do you do? In the American system, the process of public policy uh, development, formation, application is, is, is the lifeblood, it's the stuff of, of our democracy in our system. It's different from the way things are in Egypt and the world. Political science majors in the United States will think in terms of futures of engagement in public policy in any of a number of ways. One of them being academic, but most people want to be involved in, that, in the formation, the creation, the development of public policy. It's not easy to do in Egypt if you're, if you're on the academic side. With us today are, are two Americans who have been in, that, in both of the worlds of academia, uh, the research, the teaching, um, and in gov inside government government uh, reaching uh, th where they have been uh, either government officials or very close advisors of government officials influencing, in this case, foreign policy, the topic that we're, we're dealing with today. Uh, Dr. William Quant's name was already a big one when I was a very junior diplomat. I wasn't involved in the peace process early on, but I, you know, I kept hearing about Quant this and Quant that, and, and uh, as the Carter administration was uh, really leading the world and uh, doing a, something that only the United States could do in brokering diplomacy between Egypt and Israel. And that was his history in the making. Um, he had previously been um, a, a well-respected uh, political scientist in, in different ways in, in the United States system. And then since then he's gone in, in, uh, out of government, was in a think tank, which is something, again, peculiar to the United States and in different ways in other countries we've had it. These are all ways of uh, involving people who do academic research, analysis, publication directly in, into government. And I don't know where you want to take this conversation onward, but perhaps keep in mind, uh, um, all of you in the audience, that we have these two exemplars of American academic engagement in, in public policy. Shibli Tilhami, his work as a, as a pollster, his work as a, a chronicler, an analyst of historical developments, the, the book that was co-authored by the, the two experts we have, are things that I as a public official not only either read, um, there are other works throughout my own career, um, but also the Foreign Service Institute would bring in uh, practitioners like this who uh, were experts in the fields to educate us as government officials. I hope in, there's some of that happening in Egypt, I know, I've, I've participated when I was ambassador, I spoke at Cairo University, Hala Saeed, now a minister herself, did this. So it's not to say it's impossible in Egypt, but the kind of engagement in public policy or in um, non-governmental organizations, Dr. Uh, Saadeddin Ibrahim, who is here, and, and I uh, were involved in that very much when I was in the U.S. government working with the Egyptian government and, and the kind of activism that was going on there. Our current department chair is as activist as one can be here in terms of being engaged in a, in a way consistent with Egyptian culture and, and tolerance and is pushing the envelope in, uh, so far successfully um, in, in, in involving academicians in public policy. So it's in that context that I'm so delighted that we have two people here who can speak about American uh, foreign policy in the Middle East as true insiders but also in a dispassionate way of, of people who are not in one or another American political party and can speak about the impact of uh, observed over time. So I hope you'll find this inspirational, I know you'll find it inspirational on um, that level of the, the subject at hand of American foreign policy in the Middle East. But in case you haven't already read the bios or were thinking of this, please I also ask the students to think about how one can follow a passion 
for public policy, uh, political science, if you will, and how you can think about how you can engage, maybe in the Egypt of today, even in the Egypt today, it's not like the United States of today, but how in the future you might help Egypt evolve so that academicians, people in the media, can participate in the conversation about foreign policy and for that matter domestic policy. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Dr. Shibli Talhami for, for coming here, for William Kwan. Thank you to Bhagat Korani and the AUC Forum for uh, making this all possible, organizing it. Um, political science, uh, all, all the people who have contributed. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rabab Mahdi, also for being here and, and for doing all of this. Good luck, have fun. I wish I could stay. I'm keeping the cabinet waiting, actually. Okay, thank you. I just don't want to take more time introducing the speakers. We uh, will follow the order in the announcement. Uh, Bill Quant will uh, talk first, but I would just a footnote, both speakers have contributed to the book Peace Puzzle, 2012. At that time, that book talked about the decline of American diplomacy in the Middle East. Have they changed their mind since then? Or they will add some other aspects. And with that, I'll give the floor to Bill Quant. Helping to arrange this, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, over the years, I, about 20 years, I was on the Board of Trustees here, and often when I would come, I would seek out a faculty friend or colleague and say, could I join one of your classes? Because I really enjoyed the interaction with students. I mean, I love my faculty friends and colleagues, but one of the great things about the opportunity to come to Egypt is to meet the excellent students that AUC attracts and to have a sense of what the new generation is thinking. Now, I probably will only hear from your questions um, what is on your minds, but I really do value that chance for interaction. So I'll try not to talk too long. It's always a problem when you get an academic started. They, they're used to 50 minutes, and I'm going to try to do considerably less than that. Now, the topic that uh, I suggested to Dr. Bakyat uh, was I would talk about Trump's foreign policy. And I tried to think of an adjective that could describe that foreign policy in a kind of neutral way. So I said, Trump's distinctive foreign policy. I felt badly about suggesting something so bland because other people say it's crazy or it's you know, totally unpredictable or isolationist or unprecedented. And to some extent, all of that's true. And what that means is that, frankly, it's impossible for me to talk about Trump's foreign policy with any sense of claimed expertise. I mean, tomorrow something could happen that would totally upset my <clears throat> current expectations. This is not an easy president to analyze objectively. We have fairly strong feelings about him in the United States. And it's hard to figure out what the deep motivations behind our foreign policy are right now. So I think the best that I can do, and I'll try to do it in a not terribly polemical way, uh, I have to confess, I do have feelings about this president, as do most Americans. But I'll try to be as analytical as I can and not spend too much time on all the juicy gossip. Um, but I'll have to tell you, most of us get our information by reading the newspapers and reading these scandalous books that get published. Um, and it is kind of an obsession. I find myself two or three hours a day reading about Donald Trump, and I said, I don't particularly like the man, I don't particularly respect the man, and I'm spending hours trying to figure him out. Why do I do that? Because he's President of the United States. If he were just a real estate businessman or a TV personality, I honestly wouldn't care one bit. But presidents do have power, and that's what concerns me as an American citizen, as a citizen of the world. This is a man who came to the presidency 
surprisingly, I don't think he really ever expected to win the election. Um, it was almost like a, a, a game to see how well he could do. And of course, he arrived at the presidency with very, very little background in traditional politics. Most American presidents have been governors or senators or congressmen or elected to something. Not Donald Trump. He never held political office. He never ran for political office. And yet he did, he beat out, what, 14 other candidates who were traditional candidates. And that was his advantage. He was not the traditional American candidate who sticks very carefully to his script and doesn't say anything controversial. He was a norm breaker. He, he did everything his way. And there was a body of opinion in the United States that was ready for that. They liked the irreverence. They liked the fact that he would insult his opponents, not just Hillary Clinton, you know, lock her up, put her in jail, but all of the other Republicans as well. He would make fun of them. And there were people in the audience who said, yeah, he's right, the Republicans are no good and the Democrats are no good because they've let us down. And that was his constituency. So let me just say a word about what I think his reference points are as he becomes president and has to do a lot of quick learning on the job. All presidents do, but the learning curve is pretty steep for this one. Uh, he had been a businessman. We don't actually know how successful a businessman, but he obviously made a lot of money. He also had a lot of bankruptcies. It was a very up and down career. But he was a certain kind of businessman. This was real estate where you you buy and sell properties. And it, he, he prides himself on being a great deal maker, which basically means you sell or buy a piece of property to your advantage. And the moment it's done, you never deal with the person you've sold or bought it from again. It's not as if you've developed a, a bargain that continues to develop into a relationship where you keep on working together and so forth. So as a model for international diplomacy, Real estate dealing is not very relevant. Most international bargaining means you reach an agreement or try to reach an agreement. You don't want to humiliate your adversary because probably you want to keep on working with them in the future. And the notion is kind of a, a shared benefit through compromise and negotiations and so forth. Donald Trump's world of deal making is you either win or lose. You're either strong or weak. And that's the way he talks. And uh, I do think that that is a very different model for what he calls deal making, I would call negotiating, I, some would call it diplomacy, than we've been used to. And then the other thing about his background, which you probably know, but I think is important for understanding the persona, is that prior to running for president, for years he had been a TV personality. Now, in all honesty, I never saw him on television. It's not something that interests me. But there were these kind of entertainment shows that people did watch, presumably millions of people watched, and he, he was quite popular because he was irreverent. And he would, in his way, he was kind of funny, but usually at other people's expense, by making rude comments about them, by treating them badly, by being kind of arrogant. Um, but there was, again, an audience for it. It was irreverent, it was transgressive, it was not your normal, you know, everybody being polite to one another. And, um, and that was, he was very effective at that. And it was spontaneous, it wasn't scripted, he wasn't, wasn't over-prepared. And he brought that into his political uh, role, running for president. He wouldn't talk from a script. He hated using teleprompters. You could see, he'd, Somebody would set up a teleprompter and he would just push it aside and said, I'm just going to talk and throw away his script. And people would just applaud immediately because they were going to hear what he really thought. And then he would say outrageous things. And if you listened to it, it was kind of gripping. You never knew what the next thing he was going to say would be. If you read it, it's, oh my gosh, it's incoherent. One sentence doesn't follow from the next. It's bad grammar. It's everything that we intellectual snobs deplore, but it worked. It worked very well because for a lot of people, they liked it. And he has kept that style. He rarely does a scripted speech. He loves to get up and just talk. 
And so you never know what's going to come out. And that's kind of what makes it interesting. It's also what makes it difficult to predict. So what are some of the themes that I identify in this very complex uh, picture of Donald Trump's worldview about foreign policy? There are a few things that I, I think are worth seeing as not constants, but as reference points. And I give some of these to his credit. I, you will infer already that I'm not a great fan. But there are certain things that he, I think, stands for <clears throat> that could be good for the United States. For example, he says that he now believes, I don't know if he did at the time, that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was a mistake, was a bad decision, turned out to be costly, we shouldn't be involved in trying to reorder the politics of other countries that don't, we really don't understand very well. All of that sounds pretty good to me. It sounded pretty much like what I thought at the time. We're not particularly good at the role of imperialism. Uh, we don't know other cultures terribly well. And the world we live in is not one in which you can simply go in, topple a regime, and put things back together and expect it all to work terribly well. We've had a, a very painful lesson of how badly that worked. He seems to have gotten that point and said, we shouldn't have done it, we shouldn't do it again. And the test cases now are, we still have a military presence in Afghanistan. He talks about wanting to bring it down. The military, of course, always says we need more time, we need more time. But his instinct is to withdraw our military forces from places like uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. Not overnight, because we do have a huge bureaucracy that has a vested interest in staying there for a bit longer. There are a lot of people who say, you know, big mistake of Obama was to prematurely pull troops out of Iraq, and that led to ISIS's uh, emergence. So there are still bureaucratic constraints, but his inclination is to disengage militarily from the Middle East. Now, I happen to think that's the way to go. Maybe not immediately, but it is the right instinct. So that's, that's potentially a positive in my view. He also, you will not hear him use any of the rhetoric that George W. Bush used about democracy promotion, promoting human rights. Um, we have a kind of destiny to export our values, our model to other countries so that they can emulate this shining city on the hill, all this kind of very self-referential American rhetoric about how we are the best and we have the model and so forth and so on. Uh, I think Trump believes that the United States is the best country in the world and we have the best this and the best that and so forth, but honestly, he doesn't care whether other people are like us or not because he doesn't really care how other people live. As long as they don't try to emigrate to the United States, they can just stay there with their cultures and their ways of doing things and their lousy dictatorships, and he doesn't really care about that. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? I like democracy. I like the idea that other people can live freely and make their own decisions, but I don't think we're very good at exporting it, trying to impose it. And so this idea that we stand back and let other countries sort of shape their own destinies and futures and make their own choices and their own mistakes, that also I find refreshing after too much embracing of we have an obligation to export our values, you know, this so-called responsibility to protect. And I understand the values behind it, the idea that terrible things happen in the world and we shouldn't sit by and just do nothing. People always talk about Rwanda or about Saddam Hussein. But look at the cost that the Iraqi people paid for our removing a terrible dictatorship. Saddam was a terrible dictator. Are the Iraqis really better off today? Maybe they will be in a decade or two, but honestly, they've gone through hell. And huge numbers of them have suffered, and I think we bear a huge responsibility for having made that, that decision. So Trump, I don't think will do that. Second thing that stands out in his I think general approach to international affairs is he's extremely skeptical 
of all the multilateral institutions that emerged as part of the liberal world order after World War II. He doesn't like the United Nations, he doesn't like NATO, he doesn't like the World Trade Organization, uh, he doesn't like uh, multilateral trade deals, he didn't like the International Climate Agreement, because all of these things he sees as tying the hands of the United States. We take on obligations and commitments that tie our hands. And so he's almost across the board against multilateral agreements. Even NATO, which is almost a sacred institution for most American politicians, you know, he goes out of his way and saying, why should we bear so much of the burden? Why should we even think of going to war to protect is Montenegro even a member of NATO? He doesn't know, but if Montenegro, under the terms of NATO, any NATO member, Estonia or whatever, if they're attacked by an external force, we go to war on their behalf. And they're supposed to go to war on our behalf if we get attacked. But obviously the commitment that we make is a more significant uh, weight. And so he hates that. He doesn't, and that's the core principle of NATO. You go to each other's defense. He's gone around saying, don't count on us. That's pretty transgressive. And he said, oh, well, I didn't really mean it, but I think he does. I think he does not like multilateral commitments that tie his hands. What he likes is one-on-one -on -one bargaining, because there, the United States is very powerful. It's got a huge economy. It's got a huge military. So any other single country dealing with us is going to have to take into account the balance of power between us. So he can go to talk to the North Koreans and feel if they're rational, they will make a deal with us. If they're not, they'll pay a huge price. So there's no danger in negotiating with them. He's not afraid of negotiating. It's another thing I kind of admire with him, about him. He's willing to talk to anybody. I'm going to tell you in a few minutes what we might be, if he gives me a few minutes, uh, what might surprise us. Uh, but, you know, you can't tell on any given day what he might announce in terms of, of I'm willing to go to Tehran to talk to the Ayatollah about our relationship. He hasn't said that. He might not. He might actually go to war with him instead. But it is not impossible. He kind of likes the idea of doing surprises, like the Kim Jong-un, North Korea. Uh, and so there is a kind of unpredictability in these bilateral things. It would be much more surprising to me if he said, let's renegotiate um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal. He hates these kinds of trade agreements. He wants one-on-one -on -one trade deals because he thinks our bilateral power is much greater than anything we can get out of multilateral. So that's, I think, a, a reference point. Um, and then finally, he is a nationalist of a certain kind. He does not really feel comfortable in any kind of international agreement. He talks about making America great again. He has reduced the number of immigrants that can come into the country by uh, about two-thirds in the last in the time he's been in president. Uh, he wants to close the border to Hispanics, uh, especially coming from the South, and he wants to keep Muslims out. And he says it bluntly in, in a way that no previous political figure has ever said it. He wants to keep America predominantly white like him. And that does, unfortunately, appeal to the kind of underlying racism of certain part of the American public. And you know, no politician in the United States talks that way, but he does. It's not overtly racist, but if you listen to the undertones, it's there. Uh, and he's misogynist, and he's anti-Muslim, and he's all the rest. He's appealing to a demographic that looks like him, but they're much poorer than he is. Uh, and so the puzzle in American politics is why do relatively poor white Americans look to this really rich, privileged guy as their savior. I'll leave that as a puzzle for a moment. Okay, quickly, Middle East. You give me three more minutes, right? You said five, but this, I've taken it most. Let me just tell you the things to watch for in the Middle East and maybe in discussion we can talk about. His initial moves in the Middle East were to embrace Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel. And I think those are the three countries that he counts on in his mind, to kind of remake the Middle East. It's a, every American president supports Israel. But this very unquestioning embrace of Saudi Arabia is new. 
So just point one, I won't dwell on it. Uh, point two, he is caught up in, along with most of his key advisors, and of course this fits with the alliance with Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, in an obsession with Iran's threat to take over the Middle East. Aren't you scared of Iran taking over Egypt? I've never heard anybody be terribly afraid of that. But he talks as if the threat is Iran will take over the entire region. And this exaggerated threat means we have to respond to this Iranian threat wherever it manifests itself. And he's even talked about a, sponsoring an Arab NATO to stand up against Iran. I keep thinking of who are these troops going to be? Are you really going to have Saudi and UAE and Egyptian and Jordanian soldiers training together to go off and fight Iran? I think it's fantasy. And frankly, if you knew a little bit of history, you'd say there was something called the Baghdad Pact that didn't work out so terribly well long ago when the Americans tried to organize the Arab world to stand up against communism. So I'm very dubious about this, but it's, that's an issue that seems to be working its way forward. I won't say much about Syria because I'm not sure how that's going to play out, but we're in the end game there. The last thing I will say is, after talking optimistically about how easy it would be to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I am a deal maker, I will make the deal of the century. And then he appoints his son-in-law and two other close associates, all of whom are very close to the Israelis and the, close to the hardliners in Israel. We have as yet seen nothing but Re retreat from anything like a credible peace process, in my mind. We haven't seen any plan. Uh, the rumors about it make it sound like no sane Palestinian would ever accept it. Uh, there is no longer any relationship between the United States and the Palestinian leadership. We've just uh, closed down their offices in um, uh, Washington. We're cutting every form of aid we give to the Palestinians. And so on that issue, I think either he's washing his hands of it or he thinks that this power squeeze of the Palestinians will force them to accept some little scrap that is offered them uh, along with a few billion dollars to rebuild Gaza and turn it into the Dubai of the Mediterranean. Okay, quickly, what to watch? Watch the midterms. In November, we elect congressmen and a third of the Senate. Uh, if the midterms strongly go in favor of the Democrats. It's going to drive Trump nuts because his great pride is that he won the election two years ago. And if it looks as if the electorate is turning against him and if they control the House of Representatives, it's much harder for him to get his way. Watch what happens on the investigation being led by the FBI into all sorts of activities concerning the president and his associates. It has not been good news in the last few weeks for him. People have been cooperating with the FBI. Uh, watch what happens on his Supreme Court appointment, which a week ago looked like it was a shoe in People were saying there's no way of stopping it. On Monday, we'll know whether it can be stopped. And if it is stopped, it's a huge setback for his goal of having a Supreme Court that is totally to, inclined to support him. Um, that's it from now. I have some theoretical, political, science-y things to say, but I'll say those later if I have a chance. Thank you very much. Uh, you can come back to some of these elements in the answers and the questions. Uh, I, just before giving the floor to uh, Professor Terhami, uh, and I'm very glad that he could come and talk. He has lots of books, teaching, but he says in his short bio that he has been advising every American administration since Bush up to Obama. I don't know if he has been advising this administration or not, no. so, so that, that is the first uh, answer to the question, probably advised, but you were not listened to. 
uh, the second point is really addressed to students. In addition to all the books he has written, his name has been associated with surveys, quantitative analysis. Now, I have run from economics to political science because I was afraid of quantitative methods, like, like many of my students here. But guys, you cannot avoid quantification. Just get out of the debate. It is either qualitative analysis or quantitative. There is no choice. Just think of a doctor. If you go to him and he doesn't start by measuring your temperature, you lose trust in him. So quantification is a must. And Professor Talhami will show us how useful it is. Well, thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here again. And uh, thank you, Bahagat, for uh, hosting us. Bahagat, uh, I've known Bahagat really throughout my academic career as one of uh, the outstanding scholars of international relations. I've encountered him very early in my career, and it's good to uh, to be with you. It's also good to see some good friends here, including Barbara and Saad Ibrahim, and especially good to be with my friend and colleague and really mentor and co-author, uh, Bill Quant. So, um, uh, and, and wonderful to hear his take on this. So let me just say a couple of quick things before I give you uh, some data on public opinion. The first thing I want to say is that what Bill talked about, which I you know, echo, uh, is really about reflections in terms of the things that Trump has said or done over the years. Uh, and uh, there is another theory about Trump. And, and that theory is, and it's prevalent theory really in the US, that this is essentially a narcissistic man who cares mostly about Donald Trump, not really about America's national interest who has the attention span of a two-year-old uh, from issue to issue. And for those two reasons, he's, very, he's, he's actually more predictable uh, than people think uh, if you look at him through the prism of those two issues. And being predictable, he's very easy to manipulate. And therefore, he's actually manipulable uh, by both foreign powers, friends and enemies alike, as well as close advisors uh, who can get him to do things that he may not want to do otherwise. Um, and so therefore, what he actually does, regardless of what his instinct is, and I think the instinct is along the lines of uh, what Bill Quant suggested, uh, may not be therefore a function of interest as we understand it. And so keep that in mind as, a, as another view of Donald Trump, the prevalent one. We can debate that, talk about it. Uh, but that's another issue. The other point I want to make before I, I talk about public opinion is I know you are uh, taken, uh, many of you here anyway, are in a course with Bagat on international relations and uh, you are talking about distribution of power, about uh, you know, bipolarity, multipolarity and unipolarity and, and how uh, power matters in international politics. Of course it does. But one of the things that we often forget is that the very powerful, particularly the superpowers, especially if you're the only superpower, um, they have so much leeway uh, to make mistakes uh, and to behave inefficiently in international politics without being really hurt substantially. Uh, and uh, while every little mistake they make hurts someone else a lot and sometimes can mean a matter of life and death, as we've seen in Iraq. Uh, and so keep that in mind, because that leeway that superpowers have means that they're very often not motivated, or leaders are not very often motivated by efficiently pursuing the interests of the United States, and rather more by domestic politics or personality issues, or, or at least doing things inefficiently. And that's what I want to talk about, because I think I want to talk a little bit more about the domestic context. And instead of talking about Donald Trump per se, uh, what I want to show you is how divided America is today. In a way, Donald Trump really captured this division in America. Uh, there are, there's at least two Americas that are deeply divided. 
Uh, and I want to give you some examples of that division, that divide, uh, and how it's moving as, as we get closer to the midterm election and ultimately to the next presidential election. Uh, let me start by saying, you know, it's right after 9-11, the last couple of decades in, in America's relations with the world, but particularly with this part of the world, has been kind of driven by this notion that there's a clash of civilization, clash of values, focused on uh, both there and here. And many of us, of course, in the academy resisted that, argued against it, but nonetheless, a lot of people believed it. It was pushed as a matter of policy. And to this day, that is still part of the theme that you hear. What is really missed in all this, I mean, separate from how mistaken that thesis is altogether, you've talked about it, but what is really missing is that the divide within civilization is so much wider than the divide among civilizations. And while I want to talk to you, I want to show you on how divided America is, that America is more divided, even on issues related to the Middle East, than America is divided from the Middle East. And so let me give you an example from data. So um, you have, um, when in polls that were done in the Arab world, there was one that was done by the Arab Center, eight countries including Egypt, um, there were lots of questions that were asked, including the extent to which people support the travel ban on Muslims that Donald Trump uh, initiated. And so what do we find in the Arab world? On the average, 76% of Arabs oppose it. Okay, 76% of Arabs oppose it. Well, that's, uh, you know, uh, you'd expect that, right? But you, what, what is surprising is that also 70% of Arabs on the average su uh, uh, support it. So you have a divide, you know, you have 76% uh, uh, oppose, 17% uh, uh, oppose, uh, uh, oppose it, and that's even here in Egypt the same as the, re the average in the rest of the Arab world. Now, what happens when you measure that in America? Okay, so when I ask Americans, do you support the travel ban or oppose the travel ban, we're almost 50-50. You know, we 50% oppose the travel ban, 49% support the travel ban. Okay, so, you know, we're pretty much evenly divided. So the difference between the Arab world and, and the U.S. is about 26 percentage point in terms of people who oppose it. More people in the Arab world oppose it. Now, let's break that Democrat-Republican. So when you look at Democrats and Republicans, here's what you find. 88% of Democrats oppose it, and 86% of Republicans support it. So the difference, just think about that difference. It's completely diametrically opposed. So the difference between Democrats and Republicans in America is much bigger than the difference between Americans and Egyptians on this issue, between Americans and Arabs on this issue. And we often forget that kind of divide that has taken place that is so important in America, don't just look at that 50% support and 50% oppose, because there is something much deeper going on in America, and it is motivated by identity divide. It's not even driven by issues. I want to talk about that in a, in a minute. So what is, how does that show up in terms of policy toward the Middle East? Let me give you an example. Um, now, one of the issues that have been associated with the rise of Donald Trump, beginning with the uh, presidential campaign before he even became president, was the anti-Muslim rhetoric. You know, not just keeping Muslims out, but there was a, an intensely uh, connecting terrorism and Islam even as a religion. And we've seen an intensification of anti-Muslim attitudes among certain segments of the American public that manifested itself in anti-Muslim behavior in various places. So we've seen a rise in those kind of incidents over time. Now, that might give you the impression that uh, the rise of Donald Trump and his rhetoric has led to an increase in anti-Muslim sentiment in the United States. That's a fair assumption to make. Well, actually, that's not what happened. In fact, I can speak with a lot of confidence because I did six polls, separate polls, beginning with the beginning of the election campaign all the way through the end of the first year of the Trump administration. Consecutive polls, every few months I would do a poll, including sometimes before uh, there is an event that is associated with Islamic terrorism in the American media, and immediately after to see what the outcome is. 
What did I find? Something stunning, actually, if you're thinking about it analytically. And that is, every single poll from the beginning of the campaign and the beginning of the anti-Muslim rhetoric all the way until the end of the first year of Donald Trump, American public attitudes toward Islam and Muslim improved. They became more and more and more positive, particularly of Muslims. Islam also moved up, but Islam was slower as a religion. In, but people's attitudes became more favorable of Islam and Muslims. And you say, how is this possible? Again, let's go back to identity politics. So what, what is happening here is exactly uh, the divide in America. So you break it down, what do you find? you find that uh, Republican views of Islam and Muslims remained hard line, didn't improve at all. In some cases went down, some cases, but they mostly remained flat. However, the views of Democrats who were reacting to Donald Trump, reacting to uh, this rhetoric, improved dramatically over a period of two years, including independents as well, not just Democrats. So because of that substantial improvement on, among Democrats and independents, that brought the entire total more favorably of Islam and Muslims, especially as Trump's own constituency began to decline because now it's shrinking constituency uh, over time. So what we've seen is exactly the opposite, and it's all what I say identity politics. Why do I call it identity politics? Because let's say you look at the Democrats and their view of Islam and Muslim has obviously improved. I mean, there's no way to escape it. It stares you in the eye. It went up, in some cases, 18 percentage points. There is no way that Americans learn so much about Islam and Muslims that they suddenly fell in love with them over a period of, short period of time uh, that they would increase that much. It's just not possible. That doesn't happen. So what is that? There are, most of that is a reaction to Donald Trump, which is Donald Trump says it's bad, I'm going to rally behind the Muslims and, and, and protect them. I'm going to, you know, so it's, it's, it's on both sides identity politics. It's people who are shifting their views on issues, not because they're objectively analyzing the issues or taking some analytical positions related to the issues, but because you're either with this camp or you're either with that camp. Now, this is interesting with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I want to give you a couple of comments about that because it used to be the case, and I have been de doing polling on the Israeli-Palestinian question in America. I don't want to really tell you how long, uh, but, but I think the first poll I did on this was 1989. So just imagine the kind of track record I have over this period of time. Uh, and one of the questions we ask, do you want the United States to lean toward Israel, to lean toward the Palestinians, or to lean toward neither side? This is uh, you know, one of the stock questions that we ask that we repeat over time. And what was historically true is that there was not that much uh, difference between Democrats and Republicans on this. What we typically found historically over this period of time is that a majority of Americans from 1989 to now, almost two-thirds, 60% to two-thirds, want the United States to be even-handed. Actually want the United States to be even-handed. I know that doesn't, look, doesn't sound right when you watch American foreign policy on this issue, but the American public, by and large majorities, have consistently wanted the U.S. to be even-handed. However, those who want the U.S. to take side, about one-third of the, the population or so, those who want the U.S. to take side have historically overwhelmingly wanted to take Israel's side by a ratio of four to one, five to one, and that's the passionate group that typically matters more for policy. And in that sense, that group, the minority, is, was lopsided in favor of Israel and really that was true of Democrats and, in, uh, and, and Republicans. What we have seen over the past few years, and this really precedes Donald Trump, that's why I say there's a, an identity divide that is exacerbated by Donald Trump, 
And, uh, you know, and Donald Trump maybe is a, an extraordinary factor in, in a way, you know, the, the, the saying is he could shoot somebody in, on Fifth Avenue and they'd still support him, as uh, he's reportedly said. Um, the, the, in the sense that people are not going to, they're just going to support him because he's Donald Trump. That, that's what I'm talking about, not issues. But on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, we have seen a shift along Democrats and Dependents for, uh, and, and, and Republicans for the first time. So what has happened there? We now find still a majority of Americans overall want the U.S. to be even-handed. But among Republicans, a majority wants the U.S. to be outright biased toward Israel. Uh, a majority that has shifted from history. And among Democrats, overwhelmingly, 90% want the U.S. to be even-handed and especially young Democrats. And among those who want to take Israel's side, uh, who wants the U.S. to take one side or the other, Democrats are now either evenly divided or beginning to tilt toward the Palestinians. That is a huge change in the makeup of American public opinion, that we have not seen it. And to stress that even more, uh, I probe on questions that are meaningful policy-wise, such as the settlement issue, which is now big because obviously Donald Trump is basically having a different kind of policy towards it that's much more permissive of, of uh, settlements de facto by allowing his uh, uh, ambassador to Israel to take positions that have conflicted with every American position uh, in the past on this issue. Uh, and we ask a question about whether the public supports different measures against Israeli settlement if Israel doesn't stop Israeli settlement in the West Bank. What we find is that Republicans overwhelmingly resist anything other than words in opposing settlements. They don't want to see action. 60% of Democrats now, 60% in the latest poll, 60% of Democrats want to impose sanctions over Israel on the settlement issue. That is really unprecedented uh, politically. Does any of this matter in public opinion? Uh, because we see that despite that shift in Democratic public opinion, uh, Congress isn't in the same place, including Democratic members of Congress, uh, who are n certainly not going to support sanctions on Israel. And uh, m more than that even, many of them are taking initiative against people who might want to even express the view that Israel should be sanctioned. And the reason for that being is that a lot of Americans historically, particularly those uh, who have um, wanted more even-handed foreign policy and or supported the Palestinians typically don't rank this issue high in their priorities. Just like this, the thing in the Arab world, remember what we have a gap between publics and governments here in every country in the Arab world, where the public is in one place and government priorities in another place. Uh, rural, rulers are there to maintain power, to uh, advance their interests, and, and the public uh, is distracted by so many other survival priorities or other issues that they're not going to make questions like Palestine a priority for them. The same holds for America. So the bottom line is we do have an identity divided in America that is going to affect uh, how we behave as a nation and how we vote. Um, as Bill said, uh, the next really important measure for us uh, is going to be the midterm elections. What we see so far at the level of uh, electoral politics, that if Congress were to be held, if, if elections were to be held today, rather than November, the Democrats are likely to win uh, control of the House of Representatives. Not the Senate, because the Senate is a very difficult fight, because uh, there are 20, uh, I believe 24 seats coming available. Uh, uh, most of them are uh, Democratic seats, so uh, the, the Republicans only have eight open seats. So that is uh, going to be a tough fight for, uh, for uh, the Democrats. Uh, more importantly, if you look at the polls, um, the base, the so-called base of Donald Trump, people who uh, 
uh, to whom he caters, to, to uh, all his tweets, uh, all his statements, uh, all his policies are oriented to keeping that base, that core support, uh, group of supporters behind him. That base has stuck with him, to be sure, meaning he's got about 35% or so uh, of the American public who seem to stay with him no matter what he does, despite all the scandals, everything that happens. They seem to stick with him, mostly be because they fear the alternative or because they don't really follow issues or they don't follow details or because you have this counter uh, facts that are being put on the table in the era of fake news uh, and, and the stories that put out in different media outlets to uh, uh, reframe the issues. And he's been very good at that, of, of, of crafting a, an explanation for his uh, core supporters to get him. But what is really troubling for him uh, is that we have seen a substantial decline in the support of independence for him. Uh, and in fact, in one month, in one poll, in the CNN poll, I believe it was, uh, he dropped something like 16 points in one month in the, in the most recent month. And if that, if that holds, uh, I think that his uh, uh, stock is really getting lower even, at, you know, as we're getting closer into uh, uh, more revelations and, and investigations. Um, but still, you know, if you ask me, uh, you know, for the presidential elections ahead, uh, or, or whether he's likely to remain or not, uh, those of us who watch this closely, despite all of the scandals and the legal issues, uh, would, if we have to make a bet, we'd have to make a bet that he survives through the end of this, his term. Uh, you know, things are unpredictable. A lot could happen, obviously. Uh, but if you have to make a bet, that's the safer bet because of the complexity of our system, what it takes to impeach a president, what, what it takes to indict a president, what it takes to convict a president, uh, and the constitutional issues that, that, that are there. Or even that the Democrats may not even want him to be impeached because they fear the alternative even, even more. Uh, so there, there is a whole ambiguity about it. And, you know, two and a half years from now, two and a half, a little less than that, a little over two years from now when, uh, when there will be an election for the president, so much could happen. And so don't count this man out uh, in, in, in part because we've seen that before, in part because he still has that core support and America is deeply divided, even though his core supporters are really on the losing side of history, by which I mean if you look at the demographics in America, uh, the groups that support him demographically are the ones that are receding. And the ones who are uh, going for Democratic, uh, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, women, young people, uh, those are the people who are going in a different direction. That is the expanding minority, uh, that's the expanding population in America. And maybe one reason why there was this rallying behind the base is that that group feels that it is the diminishing, uh, the diminishing uh, 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 group uh, in American politics. I'll end with that. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Just before giving the, uh, the floor the chance to ask questions, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions, uh, one statistic that I heard, the record of Trump in lies, he lies a lot, is 7.2% per day. 12. 12? Yeah. So it has increased since the, the Washington, Washington Post I, I, uh, yeah, 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 Right. 12 per day. Yeah. The second thing, he has been associated with America first. And the best reaction by an American was to say, American values first. And that's, that, that is a huge distinction between America first and American values first. And that brings me to something that hasn't been discussed here, and perhaps some of the students will bring it, because we are going to discuss on Sunday one important school of international relations. The school that emphasizes non-material aspects 
of international relations. Up till now, we talk about military power, economic power, the non-material aspects of international relations, the idea of soft power. How much a Trump presidency is taking away from US soft power. So with that, I'll open the floor for uh, questions. I'll take two or three. Please try to be brief, and uh, I'll go in another round. Uh, Alison, yes. Ali. It was a thread running across all four presentations that the major incentive for Arabs to make concessions, to join the process, is the promise of a strategic partnership with the United States. Not just aid, but a strategic partnership. And I was wondering, in the course of yesterday's discussion and then today, what is happening with the value of that strategic partnership, the credibility, what kind of damage is the Trump administration doing to that credibility, and how will that impact the peace process in the future? Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, my learning curve does not only speak this vertical because I'm non -science, non non-political science major. So thank you very much. Uh, because I am non-political science major, I'm allowed to make dumb mistakes or make errors. So I heard all what you said and I think I understood it fully, but I'm going to make a prediction which I think you all disagree with because of what I just heard from you, but I'm going to make it and I want to my prediction is, barring very rare events like impeachment, Donald Trump will be re-elected. Uh, Bhagat, you have two dear friends on the podium with you today, so I need a question for each of them to be fair. That's all right. Um, to Bill, You've said, and I think convincingly, that you think it's unlikely that Trump cares enough about other countries to go to war with them, and with the exception, perhaps, of Iran. But as he gets his back to the wall, and as it becomes more likely that the Mueller investigation and other scandals are um, chipping away at that base he has, and especially before, immediately before the midterms, what do you think the likelihood is that given his unpredictability and his love of drama, he might create a mess somewhere in the world, an intervention or even a domestic terrorist event that would pull the country uh, together? Um, easier maybe one for you, Shibley. Um, if we want to think about where countries are going, using polling data, often we look at where young people are because they are the future, and it's not a perfect predictor because young people change as they grow older. But I'd love to hear how your numbers break down um, for the 20 and 30 uh, year old generation, um, and especially then a difference with, within that between college educated and, and non-college uh, educated. I think that'd be interesting to this group. Okay, well, those are all excellent uh, points and questions. Um, what would the value of a strategic partnership be with the United States that is unpredictable and erratic and is kind of America first? Um, I think that there are a small number of countries, let's say, in this region, who think that they have the kind of assets that could secure a secure a strategic relationship with the United States. I think Israel's more self-confident than ever uh, because they have the overt political support, they have deep political support and political class, and so all these public opinion things don't worry them too much in the short term. And I think they have figured out how they can present themselves to the American establishment as a strategic asset in this new war against Iran, a new threat from Iran. Um, so they're fairly sure that a strategic relationship will last, and they have reason to be confident. Um, 
I think the Saudis and the UAE can feel the same way. They can pay their way. Uh, Trump is very transactional. He used to complain that we weren't getting a good enough deal out of our relationship with the Saudis. They were charging too much for oil, they weren't buying enough arms, things like that. He doesn't, I think, care intrinsically about the geostrategic importance of these countries, but he's discovered they've got lots of money and they can help finance various things that he doesn't want to pay for anymore. He's actually kind of a skin flint. He says it costs too much to pursue our policy in Iraq. It costs too much to be in Afghanistan. Well, it's true, it costs us a huge amount, but he wants other people to pay for it. So if they're prepared to pay and buy American arms, he's gonna support them politically. And again, it fits into this anti-Iran, whatever. It's a little harder to see whether a country, just to take it random, a country like Egypt can count on Trump in the same way, because Egypt is not going to be able to contribute to the American economy. They're going to cost something if they're going to be brought into a strategic relationship, as has been the case over the years. It's several billion dollars a year to keep the relationship as it's been, militarily, economically, and so forth. And up to a point, Trump is willing to do it, but there will be expectations of quid pro quo. And that's where this Arab NATO idea comes in. We've just restored the full amount of economic aid to Egypt. Is that because we really think it will transform the Egyptian economy? It's about $10 per capita in Egypt that we're adding to your GNP. Uh, that won't change your economy. But I think the expected quid pro quo is if this Arab NATO idea gets off the ground, you, you, your country will be part of it. Where else does the manpower come from? Where else does the professional military come from if it doesn't come from here? Is that going to work? I honestly don't think so. I think there will be a moment when Trump asks, and your president says, we have severe constraints on what we can do. We have priorities here at home. We have terrorist problem here at home. We don't have the capacity to send 50,000 troops to wherever you think this pair of NATO ought to be. And so at that point, I can see him saying, in that case, forget about the aid. That's what it was all about. So that's the vulnerability of strategic relationships in the Trump era. They have to be very carefully calibrated. Is this the cost benefit of them? Question about your prediction which may be right. I mean, you know, most political scientists were wrong about Trump being elected in the first place, so why should they be right about him being reelected? Uh, all I can say at this point is that it's probably best to just you know, flip a coin and you'll do just as well as any prediction. Your prediction, my prediction, uh, it's, it's that uncertain. What you can say is that at least for the moment, uh, the pluses on his side is the economy is doing well for the, let's say, the upper middle classes and upper classes. They've never been happier. They're making tons of money. Tax cuts, stock market's doing great, <coughs> deregulated. Ordinary Americans, his poor voters, haven't seen any real increase. But they have the expectation that it will trickle down to them. Now, if that happens, it will help it. You know, economics and economic prosperity always correlate with electoral improvements. On the other hand, two years from now, I'm not an economist, but it looks to me as if there are some there's some evidence that we're getting into this kind of bubble economy. Um, you know, we're, we're running an enormous deficit. Uh, Republicans used to be deficit hawks because they said, this can't be sustained. Nobody on the Republican side talks about deficits anymore. Uh, it's become the new democratic economic responsibility to remind you, yeah, you can't go on like this forever. There will be a moment of reckoning. And I think there are serious people who think that there could be another 2008-like explosion of this kind of economic bubble uh, within the next several years. If it happens in 2019, it's really bad news for, for Trump because his best selling point is the economy. That's what most people in the United States care about. They don't care about the Middle East. They don't care about Palestine. They care about their jobs and their kids' future. 
and the cost of living and inflation and it's too expensive to send your kids to college, which is true. It costs $100,000 a year to send your kids to the best colleges now. Most middle class people can't even imagine doing that. So economics, watch that. I'd say that's the single most important thing to watch to adjust your prediction. Uh, I'd also say that Trump is capable of doing things that this comes to uh, uh, Barbara's question, of doing things that could be timed in a dramatic way to create a sense of rally around the president because we're in a moment of crisis. And if he does it in a successful way, it could possibly help him. On the other hand, some of those possibilities could turn out badly. So this is the so-called, I'll come to Barbara's question, this is the so-called wag the dog scenario. On the eve of an election or some big event, would a US president deliberately choose to uh, undertake an action militarily, let's say, uh, bombing Iranian nuclear sites because so there's evidence that they're rebuilding their nuclear capability. He, he could get away with it. If he gave the orders to the uh, Pentagon to do it tomorrow, they would probably do it. Um, better timing would be late October to do it. And it would do a lot of damage. There would be a lot of holes in the ground, maybe a fair number of people killed. Uh, and it would create a great sense that this is a present who means business. And some people would like it because Iran is not very popular in the United States. I don't think he would do an all out, I'm going to invade Iran and do regime change and all the rest. I really think. He knows that there's a difference between dropping a number of bombs or sending missiles, uh, which gets a lot of attention and for a few days and looks very dramatic. You know, the pictures will be great. And Americans will feel that their power has been put on display. The fact that three months later nothing will have changed in Iran and that they will have found ways to make our life miserable in places like Iraq and Syria and elsewhere where they have influence. That might come after the election. So yes, there could be that kind of a pre-election dramatic event. Well, I think that's the one I worry about, is this kind of dramatic strike against Iranian nuclear facilities or something like that. There wouldn't be too many, much collateral damage. It's not bombing a city. Uh, they're relatively precise. But it will honestly not change very much in the real world. You know, it's not doing anything with the nuclear program right now anywhere. Uh, or he could bomb alleged Iranian or Hezbollah positions in Syria. You know, he could strike airfields in Syria, claiming that there was another chemical weapons attack. And we never know exactly what happens in these things. But again, the optics would be such that it, some people might think this is you know, powerful America showing it's still uh, got clout. And it's possible that he might genuinely feel this is the right thing to do. We know from this recent, I think we know, from this recent book by Bob Woodward that's come out called Fear, that when he got the supposed evidence of uh, Bashar al-Assad using chemical weapons, the evidence is always a little bit fuzzy, let's be honest about it. But anyway, there are pictures of kids you know, suffering, and no doubt awful things have happened. Uh, Trump's first reaction to his immediate inner circle was, I shouldn't use dirty words, should I? Bob bomb the bad people that he used really harsh language. Like, let's go kill all the mother you know what's. Uh, and he said that he gave the order to the Secretary of Defense, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to kill all these guys, the President and all of the people who are responsible for this. The Secretary of Defense, I think, understood that that's a pretty dramatic decision, and I'm not going to obey that order. So he came back with other options, and you know, Trump calms down after his initial outburst, and the next day they considered three or four different options. He actually picked the middle one, not the most aggressive. He had one of his advisors saying, destroy the entire Syrian Air Force with 600 missile strikes. And the other one was, you know, hit them with 20 missiles just to make the point that he can. And there was a middle one of 60 missiles aimed at a single, and Trump chose the middle one. Which shows that in the real world, he's like most presidents. They choose the middle option because one is always too extreme and one is too small. That's the way options get presented to presidents by people who know what they want. It's always the middle option that makes sense. So 
Anyway, things like that could, could happen. Uh, and some people will fall for it. One thing that I would add to what Shibley said is that quite apart from the distribution of opinion in the United States, the crucial thing in this election and in the next presidential election will be turnout. Because the raw numbers suggest that Trump can be defeated. People who oppose him in any poll are larger than the people who support him. But the people who oppose him tend to be parts of demographics that typically don't vote all that frequently. Younger people, African Americans, Hispanics. And that's, that's the question. Can, now, Barack Obama was able to mobilize some of those younger people, especially African Americans, and that's how he won. So if we have a candidate, and that's the problem for the Democrats, the Democrats find a candidate who can mobilize some of their latent support and say, get out there and actually vote. Don't just sit on your hands and say how awful it is. Then there is going to be a very close race. Remember, Trump won in the last election, but he didn't win the popular vote. In fact, he lost by 2.5 million votes. In a normal political system, you wouldn't win with that lopsided you know, not minority of the, of the votes. But we have an electoral system, which means that political strategists to figure out very carefully where you try to mobilize your voters in this county and that urban area and that specific demographic. And if 70,000 votes had been shifted in three key states, Donald Trump would not be president. That's all it would have taken. So don't overestimate his, he cannot be confident of winning his economy. There is the advantage of incumbency. He is on the front page of the newspapers every single day. He loves it. What would drive him crazy if the whole week went by and nobody talked about Donald Trump? I think he'd probably quit and say, you know, some more fun. But that's not going to happen. Thanks. Now, let, let me start with, first with the America First uh, 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 issue. Uh, you know, the, there is a sense that uh, uh, Donald Trump is really uh, focused on America first, and obviously rhetorically he is. But I want to say that interestingly, in the public opinion polls, we see the opposite. Uh, actually, people feel less American than they did when he first started running. And the reason for it is that when you when you pull both Republicans and Democrats and ask them, do you feel first American, first by your religion or gender, or citizen of the world, or many other things, or your ethnicity, uh, what you find is the number of people who say, I feel American first has dropped, both among Democrats and among Republicans. Why? Because among Democrats, as a reaction, there's a rise in egalitarians, and people who say, I'm a citizen of the world, has actually increased at the expense of being an American, almost even with being an American. Among Republicans, religious identity actually increased, because his biggest constituency that has been empowered is the evangelicals who are 40% of the Republican Party. So if religious identity has come at the expense of Americanism. So oddly enough, it's not America first, it's, uh, it's really America, uh, America declined uh, under, under his, uh, American identity has declined uh, uh, under Donald Trump. Uh, it's quick, a quick answer to the strategic partnership on camp, in Camp David, when we're talking about strategic partnership between the Arab world, uh, and particularly between Egypt and the US, we're talking about in competition with Israel. Who's going to be more valuable? Well, forget that. That's gone. I mean, right now, anybody talking about partnership with the US thinks uh, it's just coming on the back of the Israelis, or, or being a friend of the Israelis as well as the US. And, and, and yes, in some ways, the deal that was done with Saudi Arabia it's not a Trump deal, we're learning again from the Woodward book and others, it's really a Jared Kushner deal. And it was essentially to build this triangular relationship, Israel, Saudi Arabia, uh, U.S. is a strategic uh, relationship with, with certain priorities. So obviously that's still possible, but the parameters have been uh, redefined. Uh, Trump can get reelected, sure, as we both said. I, don't, I would predict the opposite, and the reason for it is the demographic change and the mobilization, the, the last point that, uh, that Bill Quant made um, about uh, energizing people. The opposition is so energized now, I have never seen it like that. And if you look at what happened 
when he ran. A lot of the people who had voted for uh, Obama, particularly minorities, especially African Americans, didn't turn out in the same numbers as they did for Obama. And right now they're so energized because of the race issue and everything else that I predict, and we've seen it already in the, in the, in the elections that have been held in, in between, uh, the turnout has been substantial. And I think if the turnout pans out in these elections, there is no way in the world that Donald Trump could win. That, that's what I would say. It's really dependent on that. Um, uh, final point on, on, the, uh, on the war issue. Um, I'm with, with Bill on the instinct. I don't think this president wants to go to war. No, he doesn't. It's not with his instinct. But I do worry about him being manipulated on a slippery slope situation. Uh, Obama, even Obama, who obviously didn't want to go to war in Iran, he felt that the Israelis could put him on a slippery slope toward Iran. That's why he made the Iran deal as top priority for him. He thought it was a war avoidance strategy to prevent himself being, finding himself one morning on a slippery slope toward war. This president doesn't have it in him. He's very easy to manipulate. He doesn't know how to strategize that way. And one morning, he could find himself being dragged into it. I worry about it. But it's absolutely not his instinct. He's not going to make the decision to go to war on his own. Final point related to the question on demographics. Uh, yes, of course, demographics matter a lot. The younger people are far more egalitarian, uh, far, far more democratic in terms of supporting a democratic party. And if you look within the Democratic Party, uh, within every segment, actually, on questions that we think about, like attitudes toward Muslims, attitude toward immigration, attitude toward questions that relate to this region, like the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, they're far more on the Democratic side. Uh, and that includes young Republicans who are slightly less supportive of Israel than the uh, older Republicans. Slightly less, uh, slightly less unfavorable views of Muslims than their uh, the Republican. That even is true of evangelicals, who are the core of the Republican Party. The younger people are slightly more. I don't want to exaggerate, but the trend is in that direction. So overall, yeah, young people moving in in a different direction. It's always a question of whether this is a trend or it's just a function of age. As they grow older, they become more conservative. That's always a, a debatable issue. But, but for now, there's no question uh, that if young people turn out in large numbers, uh, with, you know, as Bill suggested, uh, th th it'll help the Democrats. Well, we wouldn't have to wait for two years and a <laughs> few months to know. But in the meantime, he could be impeached. So the issue will, will not rise. So the first. Uh, thing to watch are the elections of November, because this might decide a lot of things. I wanted to have another round of questions, but unfortunately, uh, there is no time. We'll have the speakers round for coffee, uh, but in the meantime, I'll ask my colleague, uh, the chair of the Department of Political Science, to thank the speakers for us. Uh, you know, I think it was my time to ask my two questions as I'm thanking them. I mean, I'm, I've studied the three of you as an undergrad. So yet yeah, years later, sitting here and still learning from the three of you, I think, is um, says something. Um, my, I am very grateful uh, to Vasquez for organizing this, bringing you here, and for including his home department. I had two questions that we can discuss over coffee. Uh, so my question um, to Bill was we've, we've, we've been taught a lot about you know, the difference between uh, established democracies and democratic uh, countries, in a sense, how institutions actually matter and how uh, leadership and personality does not play uh, a huge uh, uh, role in for forming foreign policies in places like the US where you have everything institutionalized. Does this actually uh, still matter? Or are we seeing um, more of a uh, decline of institutionalization in the system? And uh, my question is, you talk about a change in public opinion, but why isn't this materializing in terms of political alternatives and choices? 
in a place like Egypt, we complain about lack of alternatives because we don't have the political infrastructure. But in a place that, like the US, where you have established party systems, why aren't we seeing uh, that materialize? Should I go for a coffee yeah. then? Sure.